And continuing our series in the Gospel of Luke in uh, chapter 13, we find ourselves under the main heading uh, in uh, verses 18 through 35 where Jesus was teaching concerning the kingdom of God. And ultimately that means to us uh, uh, going to heaven or people going to heaven and being part of the kingdom of God because they have believed in Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the Messiah, and ultimately have entrance into the kingdom of God and will be in heaven for all of eternity. So Jesus was teaching and preaching about that. And in the uh, second part that we're noting here in verses 20 through, uh, 22 through verse 30, it's talking about entering through the narrow door, as it says in Luke. But you're probably more familiar with Matthew's terminology enter through the narrow gate. And so again, it's uh, synonymous terms, the door, the gate, two different Greek words as uh, we'll see uh, as we go through this and that, as I've given to you in your notes, but it's basically meaning the same thing. That narrow way, that narrow uh, uh, place that we have to enter through in order to be saved and enter the kingdom of God. As I said, it's paralleled in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, verse 20, uh, through uh, chapter 7, verse 13 through verse 22. Uh, And the parallel isn't quite exact uh, from one to the other. Matthew goes off in a little uh, different direction, but ultimately we see the same uh, passages and same concepts in both books. Uh, And as I was going through this, and as you'll see, this morning, we're going to talk about salvation, and we're going to talk about what the Bible says about salvation and how one must be saved. Now, I know I'm talking to a bunch of people who are already saved because you have believed in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but there may be somebody hearing me in the internet or uh, some form or some fashion hearing this uh, message or picking up the notes or whatever the case may be. They who are not believe in Jesus Christ need to know what the true message of the gospel is and how salvation is won because there's many false doctrines that are out there in the world as to what salvation is and what how you gain salvation but the truth is found in the word of God and that's what I want to share with you this morning and as I was talking to Pastor Bill uh, Winstrom uh, just before service again we could uh, spend hours and hours and hours, weeks upon weeks, just talking about this one subject called salvation as it's thrown throughout the scripture. But ultimately, you have to bear it down and uh, whittle it down so that we can get a message in within the time allotted for us on a Sunday morning service. But I want to share with you some uh, specific things and some interesting things in regard to what our Lord is teaching here in the Gospel of Luke. So let's look at Luke chapter 13. And uh, going back to verse 18, because that kind of sets up what now is going to uh, be spoken about in verses 22 through the end of this section, verse 30. So in verse uh, 18 through uh, 21, which we studied and noted last Sunday, it says, Therefore he was saying, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. A lot of analogy there, a lot of uh, symbolism there, but basically that mustard seed, the smallest of all, grows to a giant tree. The birds of the air, talking about people of this earth, can come and nest in that, the tree being our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and ultimately the tree of his cross that he hung upon to pay the penalty for our sins, and through that that we have salvation. Then it also says in verse 20, and again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal, and we would say flour, until it was leavened. And again, leaven is what we call yeast. And as you know, you put a little bit of yeast in and those little tiny uh, yeast uh, uh, droplets, you put a little bit of that into a huge lump of dough. And before you know it, the whole thing is leavened. It has yeast throughout and the dough will rise as we talked about. This, too, is another analogy that the kingdom of God starts with something small like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But ultimately, it expands into a kingdom that is the family of God and especially the church age, the royal family of God that will be in heaven uh, for all of eternity. And in these two parallels, uh, 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 parable passages, we also recognize that in the tree analogy, we see how the gospel helps us to grow upward. And ultimately, in the leaven analogy, it talks about growing inward. The kingdom of God grows up and it grows within. That means it's also inside of you. Because once you believe in Jesus Christ, you are entered into the kingdom of God. And now that kingdom also resides in you as all three members of the Trinity indwell you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Now we get into the next passage uh, that Jesus w- uh, wanted us to draw our attention to. And in verse 22, And he was passing through, uh, through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. So we know he's coming down probably from Galilee, now passing through the various cities and villages, coming down so that he would enter into Jerusalem, where then he would face the cross. So he's continuing to teach all the way along. Now in verse 23, it says, And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth there when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being cast out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. So in totality, between verses 22 and 30, this entire section, there's a lot going on there, but we're only going to get to the first part of this, which is verses 22 through verse 24 this morning. And then when we come back next week, we'll uh, venture into the rest of the verses. Because this first part is truly about what? The salvation of our Lord and sa- uh, uh, of mankind through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as it says here, In verse 22, and that's where, uh, verse 23, it begins. It says, And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, all right, so the question is, are there just a few who are being saved? We could say another way to present this question is, how is one saved? You see, that's what this man was asking. How is one saved? Are there only a few being saved? And again, I gave you the Greek construction there in your notes. I won't go into that detail. But basically, it's a comparison here. And it's a comparison between a lot and a few, or many and a few. And as it says here, will only a few be saved and ultimately be saved and enter into the kingdom of God? And if that, if so, how does one accomplish that salvation? So Jesus Christ then launches into the parable and the understanding of what it means to be saved and how one must be saved. But before we get there, I wanted to point out a couple of things. In verse 23, it says, And someone said to him, Lord. Again, the Greek word for Lord, as you know, is kurios. And what is kurios equivalent to in the Hebrew? Well, in the Hebrew, we have the word Yahweh. And that was the word, again, the tetragrammaton, as it's called in the Hebrew language. And that was the word that they translated Lord. And that was the word that was used for God. So by saying Lord to Jesus Christ, he's ultimately calling him his God. He's calling him God incarnate and ultimately believing that he is the Savior, Messiah, the one that was promised. So he said to him, Lord, he's rightly addressing him. And as we've seen other individuals in this gospel of Luke, they call him teacher. They call him rabbi. He's just a good person. He's just a a good individual just a good teacher. But by addressing him as your Lord, you're recognizing who he is, the person and the nature that is Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He is our God. And there were just, and it says, are there just a few who are being saved? And again, being saved means entered into the kingdom of God through whatever means that might be. And again, Jesus Christ gives us some information. And he said to them, now in verse 24, Strive to enter by the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, I'm going to speak on this word strive in verse 24 first, and I'm going to show you a lot of different verses and what the Bible says about salvation and how one must be saved. But this word strive was very interesting because it's a Greek word that we, have trans- we can transliterate into the English that means agonize or agony. And it really means to strive and to struggle, to do all that you can to gain something so ultimately you could have victory. 
agonizomai is the Greek word that we have there, and it's what we would say agonize if we transliterate that into the English. And so it means strive, it means to pursue something, it means to gain victory. It is a word that was used in the military for entering into a battle and striving to win the victory. It was used in the court of law for people who would enter into a trial to try to uh, win uh, in the in the court of law, win a victory in that trial, and it was also used for the athletic games, entering into the old Olympics as they had it back in the day, the athletic games, so that ultimately you could win the prize, get the crown, and ultimately be the victor. That is what Jesus Christ is saying, strive in this one word, strive so that you win. Now, what we're going to see here is that we can't win on our own. We can't win by our human works, our human effort, our good deeds. You see, salvation is not dictated by how good of a person you are and how many good deeds you do. You see, salvation is determined only by one thing and one thing alone, and that is faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you a lot of scriptures that speak to that. I'm going to show you the scriptures on the counter uh, of that too, where in the day of Jesus Christ, they were teaching false doctrines, that you had to keep the law, be circumcised in order to be saved, as well as believe in Jesus. You had to combine these two things. But the Apostle Paul was very clear, no, that is not right. We don't take the law and combine that with faith in Jesus to be saved. That's a system of works. And only by belief in the Lord Jesus Christ is anyone ever saved. And so that message is clear and true throughout the Scripture. And again, that's what we're going to talk about and see this morning. Jesus answered this question in regard to how uh, only a few going to be saved. He answered it not by answering the question directly, by saying, no, a whole lot of people are going to be saved because millions or billions of people are going to believe in the gospel, in my message, and in the cross that I am about to enter into. No, he did not say that. What did he do? He challenged the individual. I want you to strive. I want you to strive to understand what the gospel is all about. I want you to strive to know who the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. And he's speaking to the unbeliever there. He's speaking to the unbeliever who has some knowledge or no knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And he's saying, put all your heart and soul into understanding what this message truly is. Now, the fact of the matter is, and as we're going to see, it's very interesting what the gospel message is. And Bill, I may uh, call on you and uh, uh, comment on this in a minute. Maybe not, but we'll see if you want. But, <laughs> but I remember a conference I attended, and Wayne Chico and I attended a conference about 10 years ago down at uh, Pastor Bob Dean's uh, uh, church down in Houston, Texas. And one of the main topics of that, uh, that conference that I attended down there was what is the gospel message? kind of interesting what is the gospel message you know what is it now if you ask 10 different people you might get 10 different answers right you might get one person to say one thing one person to say another do we want to take some shots at it what is the gospel message anybody anybody want to throw out what's the gospel message yeah 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 that's good that's jesus is god yeah yeah Love, Jesus is love, yeah, that's the gospel. Yeah. Now, when you look at the scriptures, we're going to see a number of different verses that bring out different aspects of what the gospel is. So we have to look at it in totality so we see that the gospel is really this big. The gospel message is this many words. But yet, in order to be saved, sometimes it uses just one word. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. So it's kind of interesting as the Bible can boil it down to one word or it can expand it into 20 or 30 words, giving the whole outlay of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to whatever believe upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. So again, right there, for God so loved the world, so you see the love that he sent his only begotten son who would ever believe in him. All right, I believe in the Son, okay? I'm saved. So you see, that's part of the salvation message. Then, as we're going to see, if you believe that Jesus died and rose on the third day, that, too, is part of the gospel message. And then we're going to see that Jesus also ascended and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. Guess what? That, too, is part of the gospel message. So there was a great debate in this, you know, in this conference of uh, you know, like-minded believers and uh, uh, thinkers. And ultimately, what is the gospel? 
Is it just believe in Jesus and you will be saved? Or is it believe that Jesus Christ, who is God, became man, went to the cross, took on our sins, paid for our sins, died on the cross after the work was completed, was buried, on the third day rose again, and then ascended into heaven and now seated at the right hand of of God? You see, it could include all of that. Or it could include a section of that. It's very, very interesting how the Scripture gives that to us. But that, too, is part of the grace and love of God. But I also contend that you know God does that purposely because he also knows that the unbeliever is going to get presented with the gospel message. And they're going to get bits and pieces. They may not get the whole thing. They may get some of it. But they are going to get the most important thing, and that is what? That Jesus Christ died on the sin, on the cross, for the forgiveness of our sin that he paid the penalty for our sins. That is, first and foremost, the most important aspect of it. And then we also know on the third day he rose again and was resurrected. That proved that what? He won the victory over sin and death on the cross, demonstrated through his resurrection. Now, as we who have believed in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the gospel, we recognize and understand these things, but we also uh, are presenting that to people who don't know anything about this. They may know some. They might have heard it in a religion, uh, you know, a religion or a church they might have attended, but they don't truly know the whole message and the whole meaning behind it. So it's our responsibility to do what? Go out and give that message to the people. So we have to train ourselves in all the knowledge that is the gospel of Jesus Christ and present according to the Holy Spirit whatever he gives us to present at that time. And for some people, it's going to be the cross. For some people, it's going to be resurrection. For some people, it's going to be, you know, God incarnate and then seated at the right hand of the Father or whatever the case may be. But what will I'll also contend, and again, Bill can also uh, uh, speak on this as well. I haven't let you speak. Do you want to speak? Do you want to come up? And I'll let you speak on all this stuff. <laughs> keep talking about you speaking, but you know, I just keep taking over and to keep speaking. All right, I should let you speak. But I'll, you know, but I will also contend. Okay, is that at the moment of somebody's salvation, they probably don't know everything about Jesus Christ. Again, because they don't know the Word, they don't know you know the doctrines, they don't know the totality of the Scripture. All right, they just know a little bit. Believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But what does that mean? So, you know, I contend that after salvation, God also wants us to continue to learn about the gospel so that we are refined in that message and understand all the detail about that message so that we can be better prepared to deliver that message and also grow in our own grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and walk in his will and plan each and every day. Now, we have this word uh, that is in this passage called salvation. A Greek word is sozo. It's interesting that the word can be used in a number of different uh, ways. Uh, It can mean to heal somebody, but it can mean to rescue somebody. But here the context is how must one be saved? How is somebody saved? Or in in the uh, uh, passage, are only a few going to be saved? The Greek word here is sozo, and the context here means about our eternal salvation. The salvation that we received at the moment that we believed in Jesus Christ. And I tend to call that our past salvation. And really this word sozo and salvation is used three different ways within the New Testament. There's your past salvation, which was the day you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior. For the unbeliever, it would be their future salvation, okay? But for us who have already believed, that's our past salvation. Then there's our present salvation. Again, our daily walk as we are walking in the will and plan each and every day. But that doesn't have anything to do with our entrance into the kingdom. That's already been locked in based on our past salvation. And then the Bible also uses the word salvation to talk about what? Our eternal abode. When we receive our resurrection body and we're in eternity forever and ever. And I call that our future salvation so the word salvation is used in context three different ways throughout scripture our past our present and our post salvation now we also understand and recognize that we have eternal security according to scripture so once you believe in the lord and savior jesus christ you are saved you will be in the kingdom of god and that will be with you for the rest of your life here on planet earth and for the rest of your existence in the eternal state. And you can do nothing to lose your salvation. And I hate to disappoint some people who may be listening. Even if you reject Jesus Christ later on in your life, guess what? You're still going to be in heaven. 
It's interesting. There's going to be a lot of people who end up in heaven that uh, changed their way of thinking and were professed atheists maybe after their salvation. Hard to believe that that could be, but, you know, there may be a few of them in heaven that are going to be like, oh, Phew, good thing. <laughs> good thing I believed when I was young because when I was older I was an idiot. But in any case, you know, this word uh, sozo that we have here and in the context is talking about our past salvation where we are entered into the kingdom of God because we have believed in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now let me give you a lot of different passages and uh, we're not going to explain in the detail of all of them but remember where this word sozo is used. It says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. In other words, you're part of the family of God. You may go in, you may go out. Ultimately, you may uh, walk in fellowship, you may be out of fellowship, but you will continue to be part of the family of God. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. You see, the doorway that we enter into is the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You see, the only person and the only name that can save us is what? Jesus Christ. You know, we can't, we can't even say, I believe in the Holy Spirit and I'm saved. We can't even say, I believe in God the Father and I'm saved. You see, those things don't save us, but the name of Jesus Christ does. Very interesting how that is. And certainly, no other name. There's no other false god or no other false religion. And there's not even yourself and your own name and the good works that you do and the reputation that you have. And that's what that name means, the reputation. Again, no other name by which we must be saved. Salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God, is raised, has, uh, ha, uh, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Whoa, wait a minute. What's this verse? Well, you've got to confess with your mouth. You've got to believe that he was raised. Then you're saved. You see, that's where some of that debate comes in. That really isn't a debate at all. You see, the context here is Paul speaking to the Israelites who were unbelievers. And they were reject rejecting that Jesus Christ was God. They were rejecting that he was their Messiah. And also part of the sect didn't believe in the resurrection. So in order for them to recognize Jesus Christ as their Savior, they had to recognize Jesus as Lord. As what? The Old Testament Hebrew would say as Yahweh which is God, our Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, which again would go against the Sadducees. And again, the familiar joke, you know, the sect of the you know, Sanhedrin. It's sad, you see, because they don't believe in an afterlife and a resurrection, okay? But in any case, you know, in order for them to recognize their salvation, they had to get over the hurdle that there is an afterlife, there is a resurrection, and that is through Jesus Christ. There will be an eternal kingdom. So again, in context, confess with your mouth, get these Pharisees to get off of their high horse and their you know, religiosity of their works for salvation to recognize that it's only through Jesus Christ. Confess with your mouth. Recognize that he is your Savior. And then for the Sadducees to recognize that there is resurrection. All right, and again, through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And again, that is a scripture that is quoted from Joel, Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 32, and Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Again, on the name of the Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, they did not yet have the name Jesus. The New Testament, now we have the name Jesus, but we have to connect the dots, and God did that for us. Yahweh is Kyrios. The Lord is God, and Jesus Christ is our God who went to the cross, again, in hu taking on humanity and suffering and dying. So in Joel and Romans, we also see that. Now as we understand in regard to uh, some of the falsehoods that are out there, it says, for the, f the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, those who are rejecting and continue to reject and reject and reject in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Again, the word of the cross is foolishness to them. Ah, I can't believe in somebody who died for me and I'm going to be saved just by doing that. Or 
oh, it can't be that easy just to believe in Jesus and I'm going to be saved. That can't be. I've got to do something. I've got to work hard. I've got to be a good person. I've got to change my personality. I've got to be like Christ in order to be saved or give my offerings or do my penance or whatever the case may be. You see, it's foolishness to think that the cross is all sufficient to save when they are rejecting it on a consistent basis. But again, for those who are understanding and recognizing that it is the only means of salvation, it is the power to save. Again, being saved, it is the power of God. The cross is the power of God. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And again, there's all kinds of falsehoods out in the world. My wife told me a story on the way here. I'm not going to share it with anybody. I wish she hadn't shared it with me because it's running around in my thoughts right now. And it's uh, wicked and it's evil as to what's going on in the world uh, today about false God and pagan religion stuff, okay? But to them, the cross of Jesus Christ is what? Foolishness. No, it, it's foolish. It can't be that easy. It can't be a man that came and 20, 20, uh, 2,000 years ago and did this for me. Again, it can't be that. It's got to be something else, something that I have to do, something that I have to offer, something that I have to abide by on a consistent basis. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, it says, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That gives us a little idea about Jesus Christ now seated at the right hand of the Father. He intercedes for us daily. Let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And again, this is uh, one of the very popular verses and something that should be etched in all of our thoughts and minds as to what salvation is and what it also is not, so that we're able to go out and witness this and teach people about this. Because remember, when you go out and teach the the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not about you've got to be a better person. You've got to clean up your act. You've got to stop sinning. You've got to stop doing this. You've got to stop doing that. No. You see, it's about Jesus Christ. And the gospel message is you have to believe in Jesus Christ, that he paid for your sins, and through him you have everlasting life. That's the gospel. And see, you don't have to mess around with their messy life. You can let them lead their messy life and continue that for a time. Okay? But the point is, once they understand that Christ is their Savior, they're going to want to get into learning more about Him. And then that's when maybe the life will clean up a little bit and they'll stop the sinning because they'll recognize what the Word of God is and what it means to be a believer. But that is not for salvation. That's post-salvation. That is not for our, what we call, past salvation. Now in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse five, uh, verse 4, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, that's the position that we all hold as believers right now. That's the position that the unbeliever can be given if they would just come to believe in Jesus Christ. And positionally, we stand in that place. Now in verse 7, in order that in the age to come, ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not as a result of works that no one should boast. And then in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, verse 8 and 9 is about entrance into the kingdom of God. Verse 10 is once you're entered, now that's what God is going to do with you. And he wants to do with you and have those good works post-salvation. But for salvation, it is not a necessary because if it, is, if it were necessary, then the work of salvation would be on us. And I'd have to be a better person. I'd have to clean up my act. I'd have to stop doing this. I'd have to stop doing that. And if I do good enough things and good enough deeds, and if I go to church enough, give enough offerings, say enough prayers, da 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 And what all they tell you in religion, okay, they'll tell you 
You've got to do all this stuff. And maybe, just maybe, you'll be saved on the back end. But you'll never know. So you better keep being good. You better keep coming back. You better keep doing your penance. You better keep doing this. And it's their hook. And it, what's keeps, and it keeps uh, people coming back. It's a false doctrine. And we could even say it could be a pagan religion. Because they're not believing in the all-sufficient work of Jesus Christ. They're believing in you and your work and what you can offer unto God in order to be saved. You see, faith is the only system of perception that is totally apart from any human merit. You see, we can rationalize and think about it and come to some great conclusion of our thought as to how I, be, I must be saved. And I can rationalize good thinking in my head. And then I'll be saved. Then empiricism, I've got to feel it, I've got to taste it, I've got to touch it. Okay? There's some kind of mode or operation of sensory perception that I will recognize and know that I'm saved. And unfortunately, that's what baptism has become. Water baptism has become for a lot of people. Until there's a, some sensory or uh, you know, emotional reaction, they don't feel that they're saved. Or unless you have you know, the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is typically speaking in tongues, you're not saved. Okay? You see, that's all false teaching and false doctrine. You see, all of them uh, rely on what? Human merit, human effort, and human works. But the only system that is effective for salvation is faith. Because why? It's a non-meritorious system. What does that mean? It means I don't get any credit for my faith. Because the object of my faith gets all the credit. That person did the work. I believe in that. That's what gets the credit. That person, not me. I'm just believing in what they did. And there's no credit on my part of that. So, in any case, it's that non-meritorious system of faith that we have in uh, a perception and believing in Jesus Christ. The object of our faith has the merit, and as a result, because it's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved. God takes that faith and makes it effective for our salvation through the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. So, when we are delivering the gospel message to people out there, it's not about works. It's not about cleaning up your act. It's not about doing this or doing that thing. It's about one thing. Believe in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's it. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 9, it says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. You see, it's the grace of God that has come into our life. God does all the work for our salvation. He did all the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. He did all the work in the Holy Spirit to bring you that gospel and help you to understand that gospel. And all you did in your uh, 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 mind was say, yes, I believe it. That's it. Plain and simple. And even that, God the Holy Spirit gave some assistance. So as a matter of grace, salvation is entirely the work of God. Entirely the work of God. And that's great, because what does it do? It takes man right out of the equation. And that's what we have to do. We have to take ourselves and other individuals out of the equation. And when you do that and put it entirely on God, then you can inter interact with the people of this world that you would not want to touch with a 10-foot pole. Because it's not about them. And it's about God and His grace. And now it's just deliver the grace message of God. And interact with those people that otherwise you wouldn't want to interact with. And again, God doesn't make us interact with everybody. And there's some people we should interact with, some people we should not interact with. But when it comes to the gospel, we should be giving it to everybody. And we can do that because it becomes part of our impersonal love. It's not based on who that person is or how we're going to change their life, clean up their act, get them to change. And unfortunately, with uh, boyfriends and girlfriends, this is a you know, big thing. You know, Oh, uh, if I could just get them to change, if I can just get them to change, they'll be a good husband or they'll be a good wife. Or blah, blah, blah. And it's all about changing, changing, changing in the relationship. Okay? But that's not God. You know? God isn't about us changing ourselves. God is about what? Giving us grace and giving us salvation. And then even that, God will work the change in us later on. So in any case, it's not about our works. It's not about our efforts. God does all the work. As we see, it was the work of the Father in judging our sins on the person of Jesus Christ as he hung upon the cross. It was the work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in being judged for our sins. 
God the Father did the work. God the Son did the work. And now we see God the Holy Spirit doing the work in common and efficacious grace to teach us the gospel and then to make our faith effective for our salvation. Again, God the Holy Spirit comes into our life and gives us the understanding of the gospel. And when we believe, he gives us our salvation. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happens right at that point in time. Another topic for another day. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit now really takes off in our life and in our soul because we have believed and we have been uh, given salvation. So in the early church, as you know, there were a lot of false uh, doctrines going around. And as uh, in some of the scriptures, like in Acts and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, we see false teachers of false doctrines coming to deceive people, coming to win them over. And especially the Judaizers, as we call them, they were individuals who were saying, no, 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 you can't just believe in Jesus and be saved. You've got to keep the law and be circumcised in order to be saved. So they went around all the Christians that Paul and Barnabas and some of the other apostles were evangelizing, and they were trying to follow up and coming in behind. They said, no, 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 you're not just saved by believing in Jesus. You've got to be circumcised too. Thank God we don't have to be circumcised, right? That was supposed to be a joke, right? Nobody got it. Uh, women, I, I understand because you don't get circumcised, but the men, I wouldn't understand it, okay? Thank God we don't have to do that for our salvation. What a work that would be, okay? But in any case, <laughs> this wasn't a very good joke. But <laughs> But in any case, again, we don't have to be circumcised. Again, the males don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved. It's believe in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. So they uh, tried to teach a system of works for salvation, and we see that in our day and age. Now, they're not teaching circumcised and keeping the law, although there are some groups that uh, do think that you need to keep the law in order to be saved. But what they're doing is saying you have to keep their man-made law. You have to do their works, their rituals. You have to do X, Y, and Z. And if you are an individual who has been taught you have to believe in Jesus plus do anything else in order to be saved, and that's all you know, and you've accepted that, you are not saved. You are not saved because you've added something to the gospel message. You've added your works. Now, maybe down the road, God will cut through in the mentality of your soul and peel off that I've got to do some works here too and get you on to the message of it's faith alone and Christ alone. Then you will be saved. But if an individual has grown up and only heard that you've got to do works plus believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation, that individual is not saved because they've added something to the gospel. And we can't add anything to the gospel because it's not our work. It's God's work that has been completed and accomplished. And it's God's work that brings salvation into our lives. As Romans chapter 3, verse 28, it says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And just uh, right after that, in Romans chapter 4, verse 2 through 5, Paul also uses Abraham as the ex example. And we've talked about that over the last week or two. Abraham was born in a time there was no law. He didn't have a law, yet he was saved. Why? Because of his faith. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now his faith was later on demonstrated through his works, and that's what James gets into in that uh, little debate. But again, our works do not save us. Our faith is what has given us salvation. And again, by God the Holy Spirit. And that is why the true doctrine of salvation is through the narrow door. That's why it's a narrow door. You know, the narrow gate, as Matthew would say, that's more popular uh, in, in people's thought and uh, uh, idea, maybe what you've heard. It's narrow, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, only a few people can go through as this man was, uh, or woman, whoever it was, was uh, uh, proposing here. Only a few going to be saved? No, that's not what the message is. Billions of people are going to be saved. But the fact of the matter is there's only one way for salvation, and that's the narrow door or the narrow gate. That is what? Faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us upon the cross. And that's what we see in the book of Acts, chapter 15, uh, cha uh, chapter 16, 30 through 31, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, as we've already read. Now let's turn to Titus, chapter 3. Let's go to the book of Titus, chapter 3. And again, towards the back of uh, the New Testament, Timothy and then Titus, before Peter and Hebrews and Thessalonians and all that. Good 
get there, get there. All right, Titus chapter 3. Now, in specifically in verses 4 and 7, but I always like to go back to get a little context. In verse 1, it says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. And again, that's another topic for another day, but you know what that means. It says in verse 2, To malign no one, to be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Now in verse 4, But when the kindness of God our Savior, notice that, God our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we see this third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 6, Whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Notice that it says in verse 4, God our Savior. In verse 6, Jesus Christ our Savior. And there's the narrow gate. Our God, Jesus Christ, who took on humanity and went to the cross and paid for our sins. In verse 7, that being justified by His grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. All right, let's go back to uh, uh, Luke chapter 13, now in verse 24, and we'll just get this in. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on this aspect, but uh, when we come back on Tuesday, we'll note uh, some of this. But in verse 24, it says, Strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Let me just give you that word for strive once again. Again, ag, uh, ago nizomai in the Greek. And again, strive, contend, to enter a contest, to contend for victory. Basically, this is where we get our word agonize from, as I mentioned. So it's uh, agony of, you know, uh, 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 stretching. Unfortunately, it's not what the wide world of sports used to be. Remember they said the agony of defeat? Okay. No, this is the agony of victory. You see, to have victory, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of resources and power and strength, okay? Now, the effort, the power, the resources and strength, God is saying, I want you to strive to know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. So this is not a works for salvation passage, but it's strive to what? Enter through the narrow gate. And what does that mean? Enter through Jesus Christ. Strive to do that. Strive to come to know who Jesus is. Strive to come to know what salvation is truly all about. It doesn't mean strive to do works for salvation. Strive to enter the narrow gate because Jesus Christ is that gate, the doorway, ultimately, that enters into heaven. And we know that Jesus Christ won the strategic victory of the angelic conflict on the cross when he paid the penalty for for our sins, not only ours, as Colossians 1, 20 tells us, but those above or in heaven, the angels, the fallen angels, and elect angels as well. Again, he won the strategic victory at the cross. He won the victory, and he was agonized to do that, wasn't he? He did the work. He did the effort. He suffered. He endured, and yet he overcame. And he won the victory by paying the penalty for our sins. Now we are called as an unbeliever, again, who are unbelievers, to strive to know what that narrow gate is. Enter through that narrow gate. Know who Jesus is. And to know who Jesus Christ is, yeah, we can start with he was God who became incarnate as a man, took on the sins of the world at the cross, died, uh, you know, uh, paying the penalty for our sins, died physically, was buried according to uh, scripture, again, according to prophecy, on the third day rose from the dead and then ascended to heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. Again, in a nutshell, that's the full message, okay? But the striving is to know all of that, but it's also to know the most important of that, that Jesus paid for our sins and believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'll contend to believe in the name of Jesus Christ. You have to somewhat recognize that he is God, that ultimately he took on our sins and he was re uh, resurrected on the third day. But again, is that essential for salvation? Only God will tell us. 
Okay, whether we know the totality or the most important part that he died for our sins, that is what's in view. So the unbeliever is to pay special attention, focus, and concentration on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Add to his person, his work, and all that he did in order to receive salvation. Let me give you a couple of passages there. In 1 Timothy 4.10 it says, For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Again, our hope on the living God, Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all men. In John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Last uh, two more passages and we'll be done. John 14, 6, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Again, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is how salvation is won. In John 20, 31, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name. So again, all these passages that I gave you this morning all have little shades and variations of what that gospel is all about. And there are many more that I could give to you and that are found in the New Testament. But they all point to what? The person and work of Jesus Christ, recognizing that he is our Savior. And what does that mean? That he paid the penalty for our sins upon the cross. And then we have other aspects of that, again, coming as a man, and then resurrecting, uh, being resurrected and then seated at the right hand of the Father where he now intercedes for us. All of that is great and good information, but we have to recognize as an unbeliever that Jesus died and suffered for our sins, and through him we have everlasting life. So for many, unfortunately, and we'll get into more of this on Tuesday when we come back, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And I just want to point out one thing. Even though it's a little word in the English there, will not be able, iskuo is the Greek word, and it means you don't have the strength or the power to be saved. Many times the word able is dunamis, which is another type of power, okay, and strength. But this one talks about, you know, the, the exertion of your strength, the exertion of your power, and will not be able. And it's giving us a little clue when you look at it in the Greek that we can't save ourselves. Our works, our efforts, whatever the case may be, cannot save us. And that's the people who will not be able to enter. And many people are attending church today, but they believe in a system of works for salvation. Or they believe in something else that is added to the cross of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, if that's all they believe, they are not saved. And even though they called Lord, Lord, he'll say, I never knew you. Even though they knocked on the door, he'll say, I don't know where you're coming from. Okay? Because they're coming from a different place and a different direction. They're not coming through what? The narrow door. Let me just give you this imagery and we'll end with this. Back in the day of these uh, houses in uh, Palestine and uh, in, in the days of Israel, you know, they had a, 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 a doorway. Typically it was a big gate because they would have to bring in what? The sheep or the ox or the cows or whatever the case may be, any animals that they had, they would bring them in for the night. And they would be able to, you know, uh, bed down inside the front part of the house and the manger area. Remember where Jesus was born? We talked about that in the past. And there was a big gate for them to enter through. But where the family would come and go was a small door inside that big gate. And that's where the people came in and out. And they, could only, they only went through that small door. And they could come in and come out. And during the daylight hours, that door was open. They could come and go all they want. But at night, as we've seen in Scripture also, the door was shut, the door was locked. And if you weren't in by that time, you weren't in. And that's what our Lord is going to give us in the imagery in the following passages. As he said, the owner of the house, when he shuts the door, then it's too late. It's too late. And that shutting of the door is the day of our death or the day of the resurrection of the church. Whatever comes first, okay? And upon us leaving planet Earth, if we, or an unbeliever, has not believed in the person and work of Jesus Christ, then it's too late. There's no second chances because the door has been shut. So we have to recognize, again, we've all recognized it, that Jesus Christ is our Savior. We have recognized him for salvation. But for the unbelievers who are out there, we've got to give them the truth. We've got to give them the message. It's not about them and their works and changing their life. It's about Jesus and what Jesus did for them. 
and that they are saved through him and by him alone. Faith alone and Christ alone, not a system of works. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. Can't pat yourself on the back that I've done some things so I should be saved. You know, God isn't in, in, impressed with our personalities. God isn't impressed with our works and our system of human goods. God is impressed with his work and his son, Jesus Christ. And that is the narrow door and the narrow gate that the unbeliever needs to enter through. So hopefully with this information, uh, and again, I've given you a lot more in your notes as well that you can go through and uh, thumb through. But, you know, prepare yourself because this week you're going to have an opportunity to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ to at least one person. So be prepared and give that message. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this word. And we thank you especially for your son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world to take on the sins for all humanity so that all could have salvation. But we thank you especially, Father, for giving us the faith and making our faith effective for our own personal salvation and entering us into your eternal kingdom. And Father, if there's anybody listening to my voice, uh, uh, any way they might be hearing it uh, through the Internet or whatever the case, uh, and they've never believed, I'm here to tell you that God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that who would die for your sins, pay the penalty for your sins upon the cross so that you would not have to. And through faith in him and believing that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and through him you have eternal life, by having faith and belief in that, you will be entered into eternal life. And so I offer you an opportunity right now, wherever you are, to say, yes, God, I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins, and through him I have everlasting life. So if you believe that truly in your heart, I welcome you to the eternal family of God and look forward to the day that we're all reunited in the eternal kingdom. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We praise you. We glorify you. And we ask that you lead us in the closing portions of our service. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right. Thank you very much for that portion of our service. And if you have Deacon Barry come forward, we'll pray for our offering. Okay, before we uh, get into our prayer, we have a, uh, some information from uh, property management. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, they're going to seal the back side of the building, um, the asphalt. So we won't be able to be driving on that until Saturday, August 1st. And if you really want to walk on it, you can start that on, on Friday, July 31st. So just keep that in mind for anybody using the back of the building, that uh, effective Wednesday, they'll be sealing that. Okay, let's uh, pray for our offering. Dear Lord, we pray that you bless all that we're able to give, that you bless the offerers uh, so that we may continue to teach your word from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.